Okay, we're live, guys. <laughs> we're live. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> All right, well, welcome, everybody, to Word of Christ. This is uh, uh, May, what is it, May 24th, uh, Memorial Day, uh, Memorial Day weekend. We were just talking about it. It is just good to be back here in the house. We're broadcasting from the building, but we're broadcasting with people this morning, so we're excited that we have this time where things are now being restored to where they were, probably even beyond where they were. So we welcome you. We welcome everybody who's with us this morning. We welcome you from wherever you are, whether you are in Florida or in one of the states or out of the country. We're glad that you're with us today. It's going to be an awesome day. It's going to be exciting and it's going to be challenging, which I, hopefully it always is. Uh, but I do want to, we, we've been just talking about Memorial, Memorial Day, and we do want to acknowledge that this is the weekend here in the United States we set aside to be mindful of all those who have uh, given their life for the freedom of this country. And um, we're very mindful of that today, and we're thankful for those who, who have uh, paid that price. Um, and so, B, I know we're, there's, there's a lot of stuff that happens on this weekend with barbecues and families getting together, and that's all awesome and that's good, but be mindful that the reason why we're even uh, celebrating this is because there are people who are no longer here so that we can actually benefit from the freedom that we have. So again, I just want to uh, acknowledge that, but we also are excited. Uh, like I said, we are back meeting in this. Uh, actually, it's, it, there's a lot more people than I expected, to be quite frank with you, uh, this Sunday morning. So we're excited for your enthusiasm, your excitement. It, there's an energy that, that comes from you that draws, I believe, uh, the anointing out and the teachings out. So thank you. We received our offering here in the house, but we, we want to acknowledge also or want to give an opportunity for everyone to be mindful of that, that we still uh, are, are, well, we're thankful for the support uh, that you have been providing. Um, and if you, if you want to give, you can give online on our giving page at wocic.com, or you can uh, mail in a, uh, a check to Word of Christ P.O. Box 788, Parish, Florida, 34219. Again, thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for your support. Uh, we, uh, we're very, very appreciative of that. Let's jump in. You guys excited this morning? Yeah, yeah. 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 wow. Okay, this is, so this is, where, this is what I've missed. Yeah. Some feedback. Now, listen, I also want to acknowledge, I want to acknowledge Bill, who's behind the camera, my son John, who's back in the sound room, and Connor is, I think, back there too. Uh, these, this team has worked through the last six weeks from literally zero to uh, 60 in like 10 seconds. That's how fast we had to move, learning new technology, learning how to, yeah, just thank you. They're behind the scenes. They would come when we were uh, streaming from the house. They would come early uh, and set everything up. We moved furniture and set up lights and the board and all that. And, uh, and then when we got into the building last week, there was a lot that we had to install. So we've been here, or they've been here too, uh, for weeks, I mean, for days during the last two weeks. And uh, we still wanna do some more to enhance what we can uh, stream and stream the worship component. And so we'll be, uh, we'll be moving into new areas even with that and progressing, but I want to thank the team that's faithful yes. and committed to this. These are the, this is the stuff you don't see, Amen. and uh, so thank you, and I want to thank Ray and, and uh, Brad who helped us, and, and I think Ray was the attic rat, had to go up there, run some lines, we, had a, we need power lines, we needed Cat 5, and all that stuff that had to happen, these guys make it happen, and so thank you, thank you, thank you. Listen, go to Second Peter chapter 3. Um, the last um, several weeks, we, we've been talking about this movement in our mind or how we understand scripture that these things which uh, we tend to take at face value or we tend to uh, understand things from the external realm when we realize that everything from the external realm has moved where? To the internal, the scriptures start to look different. The story begins to change in terms of how we used to read the story and how we now read the story. So last week, uh, coming off of that, last week we covered th the concept or the topic of the coming of the Lord. 
right? And, and again, I'm not going to go back and review that. That's, that's all online. You can uh, watch it, listen to it. Um, but th these are, uh, these topics, that, that topic and the one we're going to cover today are fundamental and they're, they're foundational and they really are at the core of what we, what we profess to believe. Today I want to talk to you about what is salvation. Okay, I got one amen. Now, guys, listen, we're back. Yeah, I need some, I need some more feedback. I've been missing this. So, I mean, if we think about it, right, there's probably no other topic that uh, is, is so central to our Christian narrative uh, as that of salvation. Because we have, are you saved is a common, right? Or, you know, or when did you get saved? Or, or are, you know, could you pray this prayer so that you can get saved? We have developed a, a, a set of understandings based on what we've been taught, right? And I'm going to suggest that maybe what we've been taught needs to be challenged. Yeah. And I'm not here just to challenge things for the sake of challenging, but when you start to see truth and you start to pursue the kingdom and seek out these things that have been concealed, there are things you will find along the way that are going to be like, oh my, oh wow. I had never seen it that way. Oh, I, I didn't understand this. And so uh, I want to suggest that salvation is probably, at, if not the top of the list, in the top three of things that we have just assumed we knew. Because here's what most of us experienced. On a certain day, at a certain time, I said a certain prayer in a certain location at the altar, and at that point, I was saved. And what does that typically mean to somebody? That now I am in a place where I am not going to a bad place when I die, but I'm going to a good place when I die, right? So from the point of that time to the point I die, I just need to be a good person. I mean, just, I'm, I'm basically, that's about, uh, that's about it. So I want us to see what does the scriptures really teach regarding, let's put it up here, regarding salvation. It is, in fact, let's do this. There's two words in the Greek for salvation, soterio and sozo. Soterio means to rescue. And sozo means to be made whole. How many of you have heard that one? They both translate to sa salvation or save or, or some derivative of that. Uh, and so even the definition begs the question, if I need to be saved, and I need to be saved, let, let's, let's, let's just, you know, we, you need to be saved, I need to be saved, but let's understand what is it I'm saying, what is it that, that really means what are you being rescued from or rescued to? And what are you being made whole from or whole to? Is this just about what happens when you die? And if it isn't, then what is it? So in 2 Peter, and, I, and this is Peter's commentary on Paul. I love that Peter brings up Paul. Because if you read in the book of Acts, these guys had somewhat of an adversarial confrontation early in their ministry. And to see this is to see the reconciliation that took place in their lives and in their friendship later on as Peter acknowledges Paul here. But look what he says about him in verse 13, 2 Peter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. We are looking for a new heaven and a new earth, folks. Not in the external realm, right? Not here. But where? So it's not a physical 
new earth in the sense of a planet and a, and, and a new heaven in the sense of like where the clouds are. But if you read, even as we go through, eventually we're going to go through in more detail the book of Revelation, it is all about the revealing of Christ that brings forth a new heaven and a new earth. That, that is the synopsis of the book. And the city that is being described at the end, which is the bride, is the new heaven and the new earth. And that city is you. All right, now, these are just pieces of the puzzle, some of which we've covered, some of which we need to cover. But so Peter is saying, I want you to be looking forward to the new heaven and to the new earth. But look what he says in verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be, diligently, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot or blameless and account for the long suffering of our Lord, which is his salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. All right. So Peter is saying, listen, guys, we have a hope. Earlier in the chapter, he calls it a living hope. He says, this hope is the new heaven and the new earth. And by the way, our brother Paul, who has received wisdom about the new heaven and the new earth, has written about this in all of his epistles as it regards what? Salvation. All right, I paraphrase that, but are you seeing what he's saying here? He's saying, listen, Paul wrote about salvation in all of his epistles. But look what he goes on to say in verse 16. As also in all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things, these things being salvation, new heaven, new earth, in which are some things hard to understand. What is hard to understand about saying a prayer so that when you die, you go here and not there? To me, that's pretty easy to understand. You understand what I'm, I'm, I'm coming from another way to say it's a whole lot more than that. Right? He says, and then he goes on and he says this, in which are some things hard to understand, which those who are untaught, untaught, and unstable, twist to their own destruction, as they also do the rest of the what? Scriptures. This is a powerful statement Peter is saying. He's saying if... It, it, what Paul received about salvation, about the new heaven, about the new earth, about uh, having received the wisdom of God that opens up those things that have been the mystery that are now in the open by the revelation of the Spirit. He's saying some men who are untaught and unstable take that, twist it to their own destruction. But he says Paul has spoken of this in what? All of his epistles, in Romans, uh, in 1 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, in, in, in Galatians, in Colossians, in Philippians, in Ephesians, in 1 Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians, in 1 Timothy, in 2 Timothy, in Titus, in Philemon. He said all of these writings were about salvation. But salvation that is revealed through the wisdom of God, not through the teachings of of untaught, unstable men. This is powerful, right? Second Timothy uh, chapter 3. Let me just, I just want to read one verse that has been a powerful verse for me in my life. Um, where, where Paul is encouraging Timothy. And he says, Timothy, in verse, chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse, well, let's just go to verse 15. He says, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for what? Salvation. Salvation. Notice he doesn't say wise about theology. Wise about, and the list goes on and on and on. He says there's one thing that the wisdom of God in the Scriptures is to open up your understanding, and it is this. It is to make you wise about salvation. That wisdom is attached to the, that statement there that Paul is saying is the reference that Peter says, Paul has specific wisdom that was given to him by the Spirit. This is in Ephesians chapter 1. This is why he prays for the Ephesian church that the Spirit of what? Wisdom and understanding would enlighten your, enlighten your understanding and open up your eyes to see 
the salvation that I'm seeing. Now here, guys, I think I mentioned almost all of the epistles that Paul wrote, and there's probably others that, that are attributed to him, including the book of Hebrews. Nowhere at all in any of those letters is the common, most well-accepted definition of salvation is that you make Jesus your personal Savior so that you go and spend time with him when you die. Nowhere does Paul say that. It got quiet here. This is what it's like to preach to no chairs. <laughs> Do you realize nowhere in any of Paul's writings is the word hell mentioned? Nowhere. Now, I say that knowing that it's going to cause you to go search, and I want you to search. Nowhere does Paul say anything about that. Nowhere does it. Now, now just don't be offended and shut your ears down. What we're talking about is far more intimate than what you can imply by the statement, he's my personal Lord and Savior. Nowhere does the scripture even say you need to do that. Are you ready for today? I'm going to challenge you. The good thing is what salvation is, not what it's not. But we have to work first on what it's not to empty out the garage so that I can take this Maserati and park it right where it should be. Because he says, listen, the whole point of the, of, of the scriptures is to make you wise about salvation. So we do need to know what we're rescued from and to and what we are made whole from and to. I'm telling you this, this is not just a carnal uh, definition where, oh, you know, I'm having a bad day and I want to have a better day. Because that's what you do when you reduce the scripture to carnal thinking. You make these things about you. So in Mark 11, when, he, when Jesus is saying, speak to this mountain and it'll obey you, we think a mountain is any obstacle you face in life. And it's not. And maybe we'll get there one day, maybe even today. But the mountain he's talking about is Mount Sinai because we can see it in the context of what, he, what Paul teaches in Galatians. He says, when you remove the law, all this becomes clear. When you remove the bondage, the bondwoman, when she is removed, all this becomes clear, but as long as she is there, that mountain is an obstacle, and what you see is what you've been taught by unstable men. Yeah. Are you okay with this? So, so let's, let's, let's see if we can take this apart a little bit further. Go back to 1 Peter, and let's look at what salvation is all about. 1 Peter chapter 1. And this is a scripture that I know we have, I've mentioned several times, but it, in, in it begins to uncover what the object of salvation is. And therefore, we can back into its definition. He says in verse 9, uh, let's go back to verse 8. I know that drives them crazy back there. but Whom having you, not, you have not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Receiving what? The end of your faith, the, the soterio, the, the rescuing of your soul. All right? I want you to begin to put the... Listen. Here's what you need to learn to do. This is the, this is the function of repentance. This is the, the, the practice of repentance. I am comfortable enough to be challenged. I'm going to lay aside my, my thoughts, my opinions, my, my thinkings. I'm going to listen carefully. I'm not suggesting that everything I've, I'm thinking is wrong. I'm not suggesting. But lay them aside and allow your mind to receive and it's up to you to reject or accept. That's fine. That's what we all individually do. But have a repentant mind, which means I'm going to hear. And how I hear will determine whether I believe. Not necessarily what you hear, Jesus said. He said, be careful how you hear. And how I hear is I am hearing because I am searching out truth. Now, do you think the spirit of truth will affirm and confirm to a person who is authentically searching these things out and that spirit will by the means of peace confirm that what they are hearing 
is in alignment with the scriptures that make you wise or out of alignment. I believe that. And that's why my responsibility is not to teach you, but to instigate you to search and challenge you so that you come to a place where God teaches you. Remember Jesus said, there's a day coming, I believe it's here, where my Father will teach them. Okay, that's going over really well. Listen, it's great to be drawn to people who have charisma and people who teach and people who use fancy words and all that stuff. At the end of the day, that's just man. It is the Spirit that brings out everything Jesus has accomplished. It is only the spirit of truth that can bring out of the shadows the things that were always meant to be in the light. It is the spirit that is working in you to work out of you that which he's placed inside of you. I can't do that. He's doing that in me while he's doing that in you. Are, are you okay with this? So all I see myself is, is I, I see myself like Woody Woodpecker. The instigator, you know, some of you guys, come on, you guys are, I know you're, you all know, never mind. All right, whatever. So he says, listen, that you would receive the end of your faith, the salvation of your what? Your soul. So what is the soul? I'll tell you what it's not. <laughs> what it's not is your mind, your will, and your emotions. You've been taught that, right, Yanni? Yes. You, well, I've been taught that. I even taught that. But there is nowhere in Scripture that says the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now, those are components of life. I'm not saying they don't exist. Of course they live. We have a mind. We have emotions. But, but sometimes if we get the definition wrong, and if it's the salvation of our soul, we think it's the salvation of our emotions. Or it's the salvation of our will. And, and you could argue to a degree that maybe there is some place there. But what I'm suggesting is let's look at what the scriptures say it is, not what psychology says it is. All right? Because psychology is where we get the, the mind, the will, and the emotions. It's not in scripture. Right? So what, what the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 17, again, this is something we've been at. He says, for the life... Of the flesh is in the blood. That word life in that scripture is the Hebrew word nefesh, which is not life, but soul. Nefesh, so, so let, let me come back here. This is a translation issue in Leviticus 17. He's saying this. He says, for the if it was life as we would know life, the, the Hebrew word would be chaim, C-H-A-I-M. But for some reason, in the translation, they take the word nefesh, which is the word for what? Soul. And they, and they translate it as life. So it should say, for the soul of the flesh is in the blood. Are we good? And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. And that's the same word, nefesh, that was in the beginning of that verse. For some reason, they used a different word earlier when they shouldn't have. Are, are we okay? I just have to clarify that what the scriptures say in Leviticus is that the soul is the essence of the blood that causes you to be who you are alive. Just bear with me. We'll see if we can pull all this together. So what we know is that there is a relationship between the blood and the soul. Hint, hint. This is why Jesus had to shed his blood. This is why it says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Are uh, you starting to see what? Okay, so, so here, go to Isaiah, go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. In, it, well, let's see. see hmm. In verse 1, I love the way this whole chapter, this is, this is the well-known portion of Scripture where it talks about that he was wounded for our transgressions and so forth and so on, right? 
But let's go back, even in verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord or the strength of God been what? Folks, you cannot just academically or cognitively or you can't just come to this conclusion. It must be revealed. What he is saying and what he's... What, what Isaiah is writing in the first verse, he says, who's believed our, it's a rhetorical question, who's believed our report? Because I'm about to tell you the report. And it is so amazing that it is hard to believe. Acts 13 picks up on this theme if you want to pursue this. But he says, when this report is told, there will be those who will not believe it because it, effectively it's just too good to be true. So he says, who has believed our report and to whom the arm of the Lord has been revealed? And then we go into, for he shall grow up. And he's talking about the Messiah here, right? He's talking about the Christ who is whom? Jesus, our Lord. We know that. He, he died for our sins. He was despised. Uh, we esteem him not all of this. But I want you to come a little bit further down in this chapter and go to verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his what? His soul an offering. What was offered on the cross? What he spilled. And what is the blood? The soul. Now, now we're just at the beginning. So we just want, I want you, we're going through scripture, not through psychology. All right? Now you got to realize, even anatomically, your body, every organ within you is related to a function of the blood, whether it's pumping the blood, cleaning the blood, whether it's nutri uh, giving nutrients to the blood, whether it's oxygenating it or receiving the oxygen, the blood is the lifeline, yes. Yes. right? The blood is the essence. If you lose blood, you, now you can argue if, you know, your heart stops. Well, the reason why you die when your heart stops isn't because your heart stops, it's because now your, your cells are not receiving the blood. Are you seeing this, right? The issue is that man in Genesis, well, let's just go there. We'll come back to Isaiah in a moment. If you have a little stringy thing, put it in Isaiah. We'll come back there. We go, to, uh, go back to Genesis chapter 2. It's good to be with you guys. This is a whole lot more fun. He says in uh, chapter 2, let's see. Verse, let's just pick this up at verse 7. And the Lord God formed man. All right, we know this. And he formed him of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became, my, script, my Bible says, a living being, but the word being is nefesh. He became a living soul. Some of you, do you have a trans, I think the King James uses soul properly. You have soul, right. So, so translations are things we need to work out. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, remember what the two men, the first Adam, the last Adam, the first man, the second man. The first man was what? A living soul. The last man, a life-giving spirit. Jesus came into a living soul construct, having become the last Adam, so that he could become the second man, which is a life-giving spirit, the process by which you come from that to this is salvation. And that salvation, according to Romans 10, is attached to the fact that I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, right? Which means I say the same thing that my father says about the Lord as I say, or in other words, I say what he says. That's what confession means, right? It has nothing to do with sin. Not here. Not in Romans 10. He says, if you confess the Lord Jesus and believe that God, what? Raised him from the dead, you will be sozoed. You will be saved. You will be made whole. So, so are you starting to see the picture beginning to form? He's saying this. Nowhere in Romans 10 does it say you need to forgive. Confess your sins, and you need to, and this is the prayer, right? This is a certain thing, and you need to say that he's your personal Lord and Savior. 
we have used other men's teachings and made it the wisdom of God. What that is is unstable twistings to the machinations, to the, to the uh, let, me, let me hold up. Let me hold up. I don't want to go there. Why? Because it keeps people in bondage. It keeps them in the cloud. It keeps them in the darkness. It keeps their eyes dim and concealed to the truth. Because when you start to see what salvation really is, then the excitement is off the, it's off the grid. And it's not nothing, not, no, that's Brooklyn E. It's nothing to do with what you, when you die or not die. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so we have a life-giving, a, a, a living soul, right? This is 1 Corinthians 15. And what? A life. Now, this is, this is a living soul is a consumer. I am living, I am consuming life through my soul. This is a life-giving. Oh, this is good. A life-giving what? This is the first Adam. I'm sorry. Let me, let me use this. Let me use the, that reference. Hold up. I'm going to hold up on that for a second. Because what is, what is in between is the cross. Bear with me. We'll, we'll, I'm going to see if I can help you understand what this is. So, so in Genesis, he says, he breathed, uh, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a what? A living soul. The, the destiny of Adam was to go from this point to the place where now he eats of the tree of life. That was... That was the path that God had for him. Something happened along the way. He didn't get there in this account. He does get there through Christ. But he doesn't get there in Genesis, if you would. Now, let me say something about Genesis. Genesis, are you guys okay? You got your seatbelts on? Especially Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Genesis is not a geolog geological, historical description of how the world began. Genesis 1 and 2 is not the story of the human race and its origins as we've been taught. It is not an anthropological thesis on the beginning of man. If you think that, you are still external. And here's, here's two examples why that doesn't even make sense. If it is a geological description, then how is it that you have plants and trees in day three and the sun in day four? When you need photosynthesis for even that to be li liable, right, or, or viable. I'm giving you some, it doesn't, the, the, the sequence of creation does not make sense geologically. Because it was never intended to make sense geologically. It is not the story of origins in the external realm. It is the gospel that has been proclaimed from the foundation of the world, having to do with the heart and the dream and the desires of the Father related to his creation. That is you and that is I. So when you see creation and the first day and the second day and the third day, what you are now, what needs to come out of the shadows is the plan of the Father for my transformation into a new heaven and a new earth. Okay. Here's the second problem that you have when you look at it from a history of man. And I don't want to get into all the details on this, but do we know about the story of Cain and Abel? So who do you have? You have Adam, you have Eve, and they have two boys, Cain and Abel. That's all that's here, right? According to the scriptures, there's four people. So what happens? Cain kills Abel. And then Cain leaves, goes to another land, and finds a wife. Where did the wife come from? 
What nation was she? Come on now. Uh, and the, my point here is to bring you to the place where you challenge what you thought was, was just, it, it's not the, it, it isn't maybe what it appears to be. This is a spiritual book about the transformation of creation. So what? That the sons of God would be manifested. And when you begin to see it, what happens is the Spirit gives you keys and you open these up and all of a sudden what you thought was da, 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 is now, whoa! It's about me! I have a living soul that desires to be a life-giving spirit in me. As you do too. And the breath of God that made you a living soul is the same breath that will give you life so that you can give life. Here, here's, here's another illustration to show the difference between living soul and life-giving spirit. I don't have my, oh, here. Here's my phone. All right? 91% charged. I have an issue with this battery. This probably would be at 50% by the end of this message. And that's just to tell you that we're going to be here about four or five hours. <laughs> this, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I'll pick this up on the live stream. I can sleep. At some point, this will lose its power. This is a living soul. When it loses power, what do we say? We say it's dead. But if I take the charger, plug it into the wall, and then plug it in here, it stays at 100 I know you could argue, well, but you still need power and fossil fuel. <laughs> My point being is that I have another source of life that is not limited by the battery power. Right now... I am consuming the battery. Right now in this body, I am consumer, consuming what they say might be 80 years. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe 90. Who knows? But I'm consuming it. I'm not giving it. Right. Are, are you seeing this? God's plan was never for you to expire when the battery runs out. Right. When the battery runs out is a function of the curse in Genesis 3, when he says, from dust you came, dust you will go. But that's not the intention of God. That's the consequence because Adam ate of what? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I could never do this on that little board. I just, you know, I'm, I'm getting all my, my stuff out. <laughs> Two trees, right? There were many trees. Let's get, hey, you know what? Let's just do this. Let's just, let's just keep reading. Like verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden, right? Eastward in Eden. Eden is not the garden. Eden is the region, and eastward in Eden is the garden, Right? ready for this? There is a garden. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> ah. He says, I planted a garden. Eden is paradise, by the way. It means pleasure. God's pleasure. Just, I want you to see this. I wasn't going to go here this morning, but, but this is where I feel a path has been carved. He says, and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, which is also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've, we've been through this many, many times, but it's, sometimes it's good to review this. Right, Renee? He says, now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four riverheads. Now, we're not going to get into the four riverheads, but I want you to see the basic construct here. God has placed... And then he, well, he makes man, verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him where? In the garden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree 
of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will what? You will die. Now that's not God's judgment. He's just saying, listen, if you eat of this tree, you'll die. If you eat this tree, you will live. And dying, in fact, the Hebrew, when you read it in the, in the Hebrew, it means the day that you eat of it, in that day you will, you will die in your dying. That's what the Hebrew, it's, it's, it's not something we would typically say, but it, it, it holds even more profoundness that when you eat of the knowledge of good and evil, you begin the death process, which culminates in the expiration of your biological, you die, right? So we are, as long as I am consuming life, I am in death. Are we okay? So Jesus came into that form of man. He is the last Adam. The suggestion is, is that there shouldn't be any more Adams after him. Okay? He's the last Adam. Now the last Adam is going to the cross as what? A lamb. Whenever you hear the word or see the word in scriptures, lamb, the word lamb always is referencing what was the Pascal, sacri- the, the, the sacrifice of atonement, which was uh, on the Passover, okay? This is just basic stuff, all right? We, so, so anytime I see the word lamb, it is always referencing what? The cross. So what is the throne of the Lamb? The cross is the throne of the Lamb. Just, just. And he says, in Re- go, go, all right, we're in the beginning. Go to the very end. Go to Revelation 22. Last chapter of the last book. Verse 22, I'm sorry, chapter 22, verse 1, and he showed me a pure river of water. Remember what was in the garden? A river. That river was bringing water to these trees. That river was attached to, I'm going to go ahead, the tree of life so that the tree of life would maintain life. Such that it produced leaves for the healing of the nations and fruit in its season. All right? Revelation picks this up and he says, He showed me a pure river of water, of life, of life, a river of water, of life, which is now supporting the what? Tree of life. Right? And he goes on, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the. So where is this river coming from? The cross. Come on now, you're seeing this. This river is coming from the cross. This is why the cross is the power and the wisdom of God. I'm not talking just what happened 2,000 years ago. I'm talking about the cross that is being revealed within you and me right now. Right? Paul says, listen, it's not I who live, it is Christ. I have been crucified with him. So it, it is Christ now living in me. Why? Because the lamb is sitting on the throne, and out of the throne is a river that is now nurturing this tree, no longer this tree. This tree is cut down from its root. Remember the story of Zacchaeus. Remember the story, uh, I think it's in Luke, where, where Jesus is coming through, and Zacchaeus was a rich tax collector, right? And he was of short stature. Remember, remember, remember that story? And what does he do? He, he goes up into the sycamore tree, right? A sycamore tree is a fig tree. Go look it up. The sycamore tree is a fig tree. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, when Eve ate of the fruit and gave it to Adam, and, they, and their eyes were open, they became what? Shame. They were where they were naked. They became shame, ashamed of their situation, and they cover themselves with what? Fig leaves, because the tree that they're next to, that they just ate of, was a fig tree. 
So Zacchaeus, which means pure, Zacchaeus runs and he is in the fig tree, the sycamore tree. And Jesus is coming, and there's a crowd of hundreds, maybe even thousands of people, but he points to Zacchaeus. Now, you got to realize, he's a short guy in a big tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I must go to your house today. Right? And then what he says right after that, a little bit coupled down, he says, for this day, salvation has come to your house. What is Jesus saying? He's not saying you better forgive, uh, better ask me to forgive you your sins. And nowhere is it there. He says, listen, if you understand what I just did by calling you out of the fig tree. Ah, if you understand it is never your destiny to go to that fig tree. It's my destiny to go to that fig tree for you. You come down, you rest, you eat, you, you just, and I will do it all. Here's an interesting thing about the sycamore tree. It's the fastest, one of the fastest growing trees in the Middle East, right? It grows two feet a year. Because of the number of crucifixions that they did, it was likely the primary tree they would have used for crucifixions because it would grow so fast. Now, I can't prove this, but I'm going to suggest that when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified on a sycamore tree. That's just my, my view. Maybe there is some, I don't know. I haven't found the reference. But what he's saying is he's saying, Zacchaeus, you have achieved all you can because you're rich and you're a chief tax, tax collector. In other words, you have everything this earth offers, but you are a small stature of a man because you have never come fully into Christ. You are still growing. Oh, I hope you can see that. You come out of the fig tree, I'm going there. Because you are out and I'm there, salvation has come. Oh, this is good. He's saying salvation has come, and when you understand what salvation is, the salvation of the soul, that you have ceased to be a consumer, and now you are a giver of life, and where this is corruptible and mortal, this is incorruptible and immortal. Why? Because the river of life is feeding me constantly from the throne. I am always mindful of the cross. I'm always, that's why Paul says I want to know nothing except what? Him and him crucified. Oh, this is good. That out of the revelation of the cross that is within me is a river within me, a river of life within me that is, that is drawing, drying out the old tree of knowledge of good and evil and nourishing the tree of life. Amen. Go to Isaiah 50. Let's go to Isaiah 58. Is this, is this helping? Isaiah 58. This is good. This is gospel. This is real gospel, right? <laughs> Listen, verse 6, and I'm just going to, I'm going to read through this quick. This is the portion of scripture many of you probably are aware where he's talking about the fast that I don't want to know and the fast that I do want to know. Some of you might, might be familiar with this. Uh, some of you might. That's, that's still okay. But verse 6, he says, is this not the fast which I have chosen to loose the bonds of what? wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, yeah. right, to let the oppressed go free, and that you would break every yoke. Yeah. What is the yoke? Don't stay there. I'm going to Galatians chapter 5. I just have all this stuff swimming in my head right now, so stay there. I want to finish what, what uh, Isaiah 50, 87. Galatians 5 opens up. Chapter 1, chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Stand therefore fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again by the yoke of bondage. And the prior chapter, that whole yoke of bondage was the law. And it, that's where he compares Mount Sinai uh, with Hagar and, Mount, uh, and, and the New Jerusalem with, with the Son of Promise, you know, with Isaac and Ishmael and all that stuff. He says, listen, you must remove the yoke. You must get rid of the yoke. What is the law? The law itself is holy. The law, there's, the, the, it's not the, the, that, you know, the, lo, the law represented man in this state, 
the living soul state that is trying to establish a rapport with its creator, God, and in doing so, he is trying to do things to establish that relationship. Jesus says, you need to remove that mountain by what? Speaking to it. Speak to that mountain, get rid of the yoke, your relationship has nothing to do with anything that you can do or have done, but all that which he has done and he has freely given to you, that you have been reconciled to him when you were an enemy. Tell me what you did to get that. He says, who has bewitched you? Now having come to the truth, you are going back to the old ways. You're taking on the yoke again. Can't do it. Don't work. Get rid of it because the yoke keeps you stuck to the fig tree. Where the knowledge of good and evil is how I perceive my relationship based on performance. Did I do good? Did I do evil? If I did evil, I get forgiveness. If I did good, I get bonus points and crowns and jewels. And somehow I'm building up a point system. Right? He says that is unstable and untaught and devious at its core. He said it is so poisonous that you must get the yoke removed. You can't do it in pieces. You can't do it partial. You can't mix the law and mix grace. You can't do it, folks. You think you can, but you can't. Because as soon as there's an element of the law, you have now leaven. One grain of yeast in a dough mixture makes that leaven. One grain, one particle. He says, that's why, that's, oh dear Lord, help us. that's why as soon as the Passover took place, they move right into unleavened bread. Get rid of the mountain, get rid of the obstacles. Keep the purity of the word, keep the purity of the bread, right? And we know that the leaven, according to Jesus' response to his disciples, when he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, they thought he was talking about bread. And Jesus comes back, no, beware of their teachings. What does Peter say? Beware of unstable men who have taken Paul's wisdom about salvation and have twisted it for their own demise. Come on. And so let's go back to Isaiah. Let's, Let's see this a little bit better. How are we doing? We're doing okay. He says, uh, I love this portion of scripture. Let me go back to verse 7. Is it not your share, is it not to share your bread with the hungry that you bring to your house to pour for a cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and do not hide yourself from your own flesh? By the way, what did, what did Adam and Eve cover themselves with? Covered themselves with the leaves from this tree, right? Which only covered their shame for a period of time, and then they had, because it was only a leaf, they had to get a new leaf. What are the leaves for this tree? The healing of the nations. What are the nations? Those seven nations inside of me that need to be destroyed and built up by the Christ. It is the seven, I know I'm laying a lot of stuff on you, just, 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 the seven eyes of the spirit who are going against the seven nations that have risen up to keep you in death. And the father says that, that until all my enemies and the last enemy is death, is destroyed, right? He says, then you will be a tree where before your leaves were for your shame, now your leaves are for the healing. So that the sons of God are now revealed to the earth. What was shameful has now become a life source. That helping? All right. So let me go, let me go further here. Verse 8. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. Oh, this is good news, right? And your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. And you shall cry and he will say, here I am. Don't you see the reverse here? Who cried out, where are you? God. But now we cry out. Oh, you didn't get that. In the garden, God is saying, where are you? 
And Adam is saying, I'm here. I'm in my hiding. Now, everything gets reversed. Are you saying that you have been union with the Father? The divine nature that is in you, according to Peter, is now manifesting and it's indistinguishable between what is divine and what is not, what is not divine. It is one, inseparable, indivisible. He goes, if you take away the yoke from your midst, what's the yoke? The law. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of what is the pointing of the finger? Judgment. My goodness. Everything we have attributed to the Father, Isaiah says it's not the Father. Look what it says. If you extend your soul to the hungry, then satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall be dawn and darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. And here is where I want to get to verse 11. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul that has been in drought. How does the soul get satisfied in drought? It receives water. Where is the water? From the throne. When I take communion, when I'm receiving the blood and I'm receiving the blood, I'm mindfully going into a meditative state where I'm now receiving the water of the cross. That water is the word of the Father. The word of the Father is what causes the drought inside of me, the famine inside of me to be satisfied. So now no longer is this tree uh, being nourished, but now the tree, uh, I mean the river of life is nourishing the tree of life producing fruit. And its leaves are for my healing. That is the meditative state that I enter into when I take the bread. Are you seeing this? He says, do this until he comes. Coming is the revealing of the Christ. And he progressively reveals himself to those who are searching after him. Right? Right? And so he comes and he keeps coming. He comes, you do this, you, you engage the cross. I'm engaging the river of life. I am mindful of this I, because I am seated with him in heavenly places. I am thinking of things at that level, Colossians 3. No longer the things of the earth, which is my body and the pain that's in it and the circumstances that surround. I'm not occupied by that. No longer am I focused on what is death, but now I am consumed by what is life. When that happens, what happens? He comes. And what do I see? I don't see him as he was. I see him as he is. And as I see him as he is, as looking into a mirror, I am being transformed into the very same image from what? Glory to glory. Come on, this is good. We were just waiting to die to go to a place. Says now this is about life. Now this is about salvation. Today, Zacchaeus, salvation has come to your home. My goodness. Look what he says. He says that you would satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones because it is flesh and bone that inherits, not flesh and blood. Ah. And shall be like a what? A watered garden. This is a garden. Right? Didn't, didn't God say, didn't he breathe into Adam? He became what? A living soul and he placed him in a garden. Right? When Jesus was raised from the dead, he was raised into a garden. The first man came out of a garden. The second man comes out of a garden. Come on, can you see this? Where is the garden? He says it right here in Isaiah 58. He says, and you shall be a watered garden. This is happening inside of you folks. There is a man that must die and a man that must be resurrected inside of you because you are a watered garden. You shall be a ward, like a water garden and like a spring of water whose waters If the waters do not fail, 
I am not functioning off of a battery anymore. I have a direct source of life that never, ever is depleted. I have moved from corruptibility, from mortality. Are you saying the gospel? Who has believed our report? And to whom has the strength of God's arm been what? Revealed to me. That the spirit of wisdom and understanding would open up my eyes to see the, the, the glory of the hope of his calling. My goodness, this is amazing. This is what Paul talks about in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, in Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Come on, in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Philemon. This is what he's speaking of. Not how to die well, so to speak. Come on. And this must be revealed. By the Spirit. Can I, can I go one more place? And then we'll, we'll, we'll bring this. Go to Ezekiel. Chapter 47. This chapter holds a very special place. Chapter 47. Ezekiel 47. Towards the end. In that... Forty-seven. By the way, could I, could I step back one second? I feel like the Spirit is just whispering something. This fig tree. And we know this, this is symbolism. This is metaphor and all that. Covered that last week. Jesus is moving towards the end of his ministry. Coming to the cross. And he's walking towards Bethany. And while he's walking, he sees a fig tree. Why a fig tree? Right? It's Mark 11. And the disciples have no idea what he's doing. And I wouldn't have had any idea what he was doing. I'm not. Jesus stops to see if it has leaves. Why? Because as long as the fig tree has leaves, Adam remains in shame. He had to remove the shame of Adam to bring him the tree of life. Zacchaeus, the name Zacchaeus means pure one. The pure one was concealed in shame. See, see we, we, we have such a weird view of humanity because we take scriptures like our right, you know, our righteousness is as filthy rags. We take it all out of context. So we think we're, we're horrible people. And, and to think that you're horrible, trying to serve a God who loves what's horrible, and you remain thinking you're horrible, is the ultimate inconsistency. Are you following me? You'll learn to love yourself. In fact, Ephesians, Paul says in Ephesians, unless you love, unless a husband can love his wife, he can never love himself. I'm not talking about narcissism or pride or hubris. I'm talking about realizing what's happening within this temple and loving it even with all of its faults and weaknesses and shortcomings. Because the way the Father sees this is purity that has been wrapped up in shame. He sees the fig tree and he sees its leaves and what does he do? He curses the tree so that the tree would produce no more shame. He leaves. On his way back, Peter notices, not, not, Jesus doesn't make, he, Jesus knows what he's doing is prophetically expressing the Father's will, right? He says, I do nothing except I see the Father doing it. I say nothing except I hear what he says. And so Peter says, Jesus, behold, the tree that you have cursed has withered away. Withered meaning it lost its, it's still there. It just lost its leaves. There's no more shame. So Jesus responds and says, if you have the faith of God or God's faith, you will say to that same mountain, be uprooted and cast into the sea and it will obey you. 
Now, we've taken that as a formula of how to execute faith because we want to get a new car. That is unstable teaching. No, it is. What he's saying is this is how you get rid of the yoke of the law mindset mentality so that once the shame is gone, once the hiding is no longer necessary, I come out as who I am, and what the Father does is allows the river to nourish the tree of life in me. I am a well-watered garden. You are a well-watered garden. The problem is, is that we don't understand this because we've been taught poorly. Is that, is that okay? So Ezekiel picks up this vision, and I don't have chance, the chance to go back, but if you go back to, I think, chapter 44, there about, this is Ezekiel's vision of the temple. Now, come on, guys. You've been with us for a while. When you see the temple, what are you seeing? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's not euphemism. That He's saying your body is the temple. So whatever he's seeing in this vision is no longer on a hill in Jerusalem, but it's inside of you. Are we good with that? Right, this, is the, this is where we begin to internalize and we begin to meditate so that we can see good success. Right? Joshua 1. So I want to pick this up in verse 47. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing. The whole temple was built around the model of the, crucif the crucifixion of the Messiah. The blood that was offered on the mercy seat was the blood that was to be released on the cross. The bread that was offered for showbread was the very body of the Messiah. Are you start, you're seeing this was not just some happenstance. It was the prophetic image that the, cru that the Messiah must first suffer and be glorified. He suffers and then he's glorified. Remember the road to Emmaus, don't you know? He says, you, you should have known these things, that the Messiah should have suffered so that he would be glorified. So that you no longer have to suffer but share in his glory. That's grace. Is that making sense? So let me go on, let me read this real quickly. Oh, wow. All right. I'm running out of time. He says, he brought me out by the, uh, let me go, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the front of the temple faced the east. Oh, I could get into all of this as it related to Eden and the eastward and all that, but you can discover all this stuff. He says, the water was flowing from the right side of the temple, the south of the order. Where do you think the water was flowing from? When they pierced him. What came out was blood and water. The blood for the redemption of sin. The water for the, for the, for the, uh, the, the parched soul would be satisfied. Effectively, you have a new soul, a new source of life that is not corruptible anymore, that is not subject to weakness, sickness, or death itself. Who has believed this report? Come on now. This is what needs to be preached. He goes... Uh, he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me back to the bank of the river. When I returned, there, was a there along the bank of the river, there were many trees on one side and the other. Mm, we can tie this to Revelation. That's the tree of life. Remember, there were trees on both sides. So, uh, he said, then he said to me, the water flows towards the eastern regions down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. Listen, I want you to understand what is happening inside of you. This is a picture, a vision Ezekiel has. He's using the temple, but even in the temple he sees a vision. But this is now Paul's wisdom being revealed. This is happening within you. He says, out of the throne, the what? The cross. Come on now. Out of the throne flowed a river. Right? And, and then it flowed down from the throne and it went into the great sea. The great sea is the dead sea. Now the dead sea is dead because the seawater has mixed so much with the dust of the earth that the minerals of the dust of the earth and the seawater have become basically brine. In other words, the great sea is Adam's water. It is the dust of the ground that is mixed with the water to make the water bitter and poison. But James says, ought not bitter and, and sweet water come from the same fountain? Only one. Right? So, so what he's saying is that the river flowed down 
For, let, let me just, let me read. He says, when I return, uh, verse 8, then he said to me, the water flows towards the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters into the sea. When it reaches the sea, the waters are healed. Adam is addressed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, whether wherever the river goes, will live. This is the work of the spirit of life operating within your being. And it is the word of the Father. Jesus says uh, that I have, uh, and Paul says in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, that we are cleansed by what? The water of the word. The word of the Father is bringing life to everything that was dead. But once it comes in contact with death, it becomes life. Oh, this is good. He says, and every living thing that moves, wherever the, wherever the river goes, will live. There will be great multitude of fish, because the waters go there, for they will be healed, and everything will live wherever the river goes. Wherever the river goes. Wherever the flow of the throne of God, the crucifixion, that we would know him and him crucified, and that's it. Wherever that river goes will address death and evict it. It shall be that fishermen, will stand by from En Gedi to En Gliam. They will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kind as the fish of the great sea, exceedingly many, life flourishing. But its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. What are the swamps and the marshes of your life? Wherever the river is not flowing. Of course, a swamp is, is where there's just enough water, but not the flowing of water, right? So what he's saying is, let the river flow. Isn't there a song? Let the river. Just, uh, you know. <laughs> all uh, along the bank of the river, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not. What happened to the tree, the fig tree and its leaf? It withered. And their fruit will never fail. They will bear fruit every month because their waters flow from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. Inside of me. I'm no longer waiting for something to happen on the planet. I'm no longer waiting for some prophecy to be fulfilled. By the way, when it says that everything in Christ is yes and amen, that statement means that every prophecy that had ever had to be fulfilled is done. There's nothing left. Zero, folks. And that's why it says that, 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 that the scriptures are, of not, are not of a private interpretation. You can't take this and privately interpret what has already been fulfilled. For the spirit of prophecy is what? Christ is that spirit. The testimony is the spirit of prophecy. And what is the testimony? He who is dead is now alive forevermore. When that testimony is inside of me, the river is released, the dam is destroyed, the levees are broken, and whatever was dead that that water comes in contact with is now coming alive. And he says, if I knock on the door, I'm knocking, knocking. If you open the door, I will come inside of you and we'll make all this stuff happen and you will be saved hmm. I'm done I got one minute left this is good that's a that's a clap track we have no these are real people <laughs> isn't this good this is salvation this is sozo. This is soteria. This is what I, I am being rescued from this leaf into this leaf, from this tree into this, from this garden into this garden. And here's one last thing. I'll leave this with you. Interesting thing. Mary comes into the garden, and she doesn't know what Jesus, who Jesus is, because what? He's not recognized. And as soon as he says Mary, he, she says Rabboni, meaning though he is form, his form has changed, his word is everlasting. The voice has never changed. Mary knew the voice, though the man has changed. The voice, he says, among many voices, you will know the voice of the good shepherd. Come on, when you begin to meditate, get in your prayer closet, get alone with, you, with, with him in communion. Listen for the voice. That has never changed. 
that said, let us make man, is the same voice that said, today salvation has come to your home. Yeah. Oh, this is good. Father, I thank you. Thank you. Oh, I thank you for the, for the opportunity to have our eyes opened, our, our understanding uh, open, Father. We have ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart that will receive. I pray this word, Father, would make its way deep in the recesses of our heart, never to be removed. But, Father, as a seed would, would produce the harvest, and at the right time that harvest will be brought in. I thank you, Father, that these people that I'm speaking to here in this house, in this building right now, and everyone who is watching on our live cast, everyone, Father, is a well-watered garden whose soul will thirst no more because they have, eat, they have drunk from the waters that will never fail. Father, I pray for strength in their bodies, for physical healing in their members, for sanity in their minds, and for everything that is needed by your grace to walk out the days of this salvation so that the world will see the manifestation of the sons of God. In the name of our King and Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. You guys have an amazing week. We'll see you next week. Hey, Walter. Hey, buddy.